I haven't started it. Word. Yeah, I have done that. Okay, so go ahead. Okay. And let's go. Well, we, th we think we are in for a treat today. It's a very, very interesting topic that Tom is going to be speaking on. Uh, for those of us who are working in OCMS, Tom really is uh, obviously very well known. He's our academic dean, academic dean of the research program of OCMS. But for those of you who are, who are joining from outside, perhaps I should just say a few things about Tom. Uh, Tom's expertise is uh, in China and Southeast uh, Asia Church and State. Um, in Singapore, he served as chair of the Theological Review and Response Committee of uh, the Presbyterian Church uh, of Singapore. And as an executive board member of the National Council of Churches in Singapore, uh, he authored Acquainted with Grief, uh, Wang Mingdao's Stand for the Persecuted Church in China. Uh, and he has uh, also got numerous articles on Christianity and Christian social engagement in Asia and Southeast Asia. Tom is also a member of uh, the Lausanne uh, Congress Global Diaspora Network and uh, European coordinator of uh, the Lausanne European Diaspora Educators Group. Uh, and he's a missionary co-worker with the Presbyterian Church of, uh, of uh, U U USA. So that's, that's probably enough. Uh, and without any further ado, I'd like to pass this time on to Tom. Tom has one hour in which to make his presentation and then we'll have sufficient time for discussion. Okay, so over to Tom. Well, thank you, David, and welcome to all of you. And it's good to see so many familiar faces. Um, this lecture is entitled, What Does Carl Schmidt Have to Do with Mission, Ministry, and Politics in China Today? And I said a lot. And, and I said that because what would a guy who lived from 1888 to 1985 in Germany have anything to do with Christianity and politics in China today? But it is a lot. And it was surprising to me because this uh, whole paper got started when I was looking at Sinicization in China and the, the policies there. And what, what struck me was I was puzzled by Xi Jinping's attention to religion and his and the cynicization that began to appear in his speeches and policies that would attempt to transform Christian doctrine and retranslate the Bible so as to produce a new version of Christianity compatible in today's China. Now, many have suggested that C is the new Mao, as you see on this Time magazine cover. Um, and certainly there is evidence to suggest that that could be the case, or at least C puts on me many of the things that were true of Mao. For example, um, he often appears as the great helmsman, which uh, Mao was known as. Um, he's um, an authoritarian leader who firmly exercises command and control of the nation in probably a greater degree than anyone since Mao. There's a whole cult of personality that swirls around him. And as you can see there on slide, there's a book of, called The Thoughts of Xi Jinping or in Chinese Xi Jinping Thought, which is, a, which is a, something that people are to read and model after. There's even a Xi Jinping app where you can get on and do games and things where uh, it tests how, how much you know of C. Um, but these are in many ways cosmetic, not substantial. Is she truly Maoist, revolutionary, and one who embraces Mao's revolutionary vision and habits? Well, this is a much more difficult question to answer. Um, for Chinese, China's leaders have always kept their politics close to their chest. And it requires those of us peering in to discover the structures that lie beneath the policies put in place and proclaimed. Now, the reason I've got this picture up, this is a, um, a picture um, uh, or, or a painting from the Song Dynasty. And I've always been fascinated by Tong and Song uh, poetry and painting. For what's important about it is not what is seen but what is unseen. 
Um, this uh, a painting, Fang Chun Yu Ji, or Fragrant uh, Spring, Rain and, and, and the Sun Coming Out, you have to see coming out. So here, here is a, this, this uh, painting exudes fragrance, but of course it's a painting. Because what in, in, in poetry, it's not the thing seen, but what the unseen that lies behind it. And that's the, uh, that what lies unobserved behind that we have to pay attention to. And in the same way in this paper, I wanna look at the policies and practices and also the writings of various scholars to get a sense of the essence of C and what's going on in China and what, and what are the implications of that? And, and when I get to the end, my conclusion will be it's significant. And part of that significance comes from the writings and the work of Carl Schmitt. But we begin with um, what I call the rise of the statists. In the 1990s, after the Tiananmen demonstrations, many scholars began to debate what had gone wrong and how the state should respond. They fell roughly into four camps along two axes as seen here in the picture that comes from Sebastian Daig's uh, article. Basically, you have one axis between those who look for uh, on democracy and civil liberties on one side and on the other side, authoritarianism and greater CP, uh, chi uh, Chinese Communist Party intervention. On one axis, you have social planned economy and the gov uh, government uh, running the economy. On the other side, you have people who are arguing for capitalism and market reforms. And what from these axes has emerged are four schools of thought and scholarship. You have the intra-party social democrats who argue for more social liberalism and uh, values, but with government imposition of socialist mechanisms that would provide a fair distribution of the wealth in the country. You have the old and the left that also argued for greater fairness, but to be achieved by a return to revolutionary Chinese Communist Party control. You have the liberals who embrace universal values, greater freedom of expression, the rise of civil society to be able to openly point out errors of the ruling Communist Party, an end to corruption and crony capitalism, and greater judicial independence and call for the rule of law. And finally, you have the status, who we would regard as neo-authoritarian, status who both argue for a strong uh, 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 Communist Party control and intervention, but argue that this must be mindful of economics and view that greater power and intervention by the Communist Party and the party leader actually enhances China's economic growth and political uh, power. This latter group known as the status uh, gained increasing voice and prominence in the rule of Hu Jintao and Wen Jiabao from 2002 to 2012. But with Xi Jinping from 2013 to the present, they have gained ever greater favor and influence and have been drawn into the halls of power. The status of the three emphases are as follows. First, they emphasize political sovereignty of the Communist Party over the rule of law. Two, they seek to untangle politics from what they call judicialization that occurs when courts get involved in political matters or party matters. And finally, they critique uh, the liberals' uh, 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 emphasis on universal values and appeals to Western li liberal democracy as inappropriate to China and Chinese exceptionalism. But when you peer beneath the surface, these status uh, um, these, and look at these status as writing, you bump again and again into the political and legal scaffolding of Carl Schmitt. But who was Carl Schmitt? Carl Schmitt was a conservative Catholic legal scholar 
His first books burst upon the German academic scene in 1923. His works take aim at the failure and weaknesses of liberal democracy. In the period of the German Weimar Republic, which is, was in the process of collapsing and creating great crises across Germany at that time. People were homeless and starving in the streets. It was a horrible time. Schmidt's treatise um, was that modern liberalism undermines national political existence due to its inability to protect citizens from external enemies. Liberalism's structural de legal deformity was revealed in this national crisis. Parliamentarism and liberalism were not only ineffective, for Schmidt, they were the very fetter binding political decision and action. Law and liberalism only produced endless debates and litigation that only cast the nation deeper into chaos. Smith's solution to this problem lay in three interlocking ideas. That from here on, I'm going to refer to as Schmidt's Trinity. And Trinity is a good form because each must be in place with the others. They're not separate concepts, but they're concepts that inform and flow in and out of each other and yet are distinct. So the first is the political or politics as conflict. The second is the state of exception. And third is the friend enemy distinction. And out of that, what comes out of national homogeneity. In terms of the political, Schmidt believed that conflict was the ground from which all politics emerge. Conflict produces union or separation, association or disassociation, and the distinction between friend from foe, and in so doing forms a nation and a national identity. For Schmidt, liberal democracy produces the opposite. It effaces the necessary friend-foe distinction at the heart of true nation building and politics. Liberalism's neutrality only produced consumers and culturally interested individuals who fly apart at the presence of any truly united foe and enemy. For Schmidt, this depoliticized liberalism was a cancer upon the body politic whose pathology was consumerist cosmopolitan individualism. What crisis then revealed was secondly, after the political, what he referred to as the state of exception. In a state of exception, a sovereign must emerge who announces the crisis and its danger to the nation. Thus Schmidt's dictum, the sovereign is he who decides on the state of exception. So it is the job of the, uh, the sovereign to say, we're in a completely new sp space because of the crisis and the normal laws no longer apply when the law must be set aside to save the nation and the people. Thus, a state of exception calls for dictatorial powers to defend the political order in crisis. Civil, ethical, and moral flaws may serve in normal, uh, no, I mean, civil, ethical, and moral laws may serve in normal times, but in a state of exception, they are set aside to protect the nation and the people. Thus Schmidt's dicta, the rule proves nothing, exception proves everything. Finally, the third, friend enemy distinction or homogeneity. Even as the state of exception served to distinguish friend from foe, once recognized, a friend, uh, uh, friends make up a homogeneity, which is, for Schmidt was the foundation of a new ordered state 
forged out of the previous chaos. The problem with liberal states, according to Schmidt, is they lack homogeneity and thus mix, uh, mix up friends and enemies and indifferent persons with radically conflicting values who are all competing for political power uh, via the means of formal, um, formal le legality. So the problem with uh, liberal democracy was it, it didn't produce anything. It didn't produce a nation. It simply produced a group of individuals fighting with each other. When crisis emerged, the edifice of the state then crumbles due to the clay feet of liberalism as it cannot form a united people and nation due to its inability to distinguish friend from enemy. National homogeneity ensures that all citizens are friends of the state, according to Schmidt. This unifies the nation and marshals its productive and physical energies to defend the nation and destroy the enemy. And so the job that Schmidt saw himself doing was to separate liberal from democracy. Democracy represented the people but liberalism destroyed any concept of the people. Listen carefully to this quotation then of Schmidt. The belief in parliamentarism, in government by discussion, belongs to the intellectual world of liberalism. It does not belong to democracy. Both liberalism and democracy have to be distinguished from one another so that the patchwork picture that makes up modern mass democracy can be recognized. Every actual democracy rests on the principle that not only equals uh, are equals equal, but unequals will not be treated equally. Democracy requires therefore first homogeneity and second, if the need arises, elimination or eradication of heterogeneity. The Schmidt's trinity of uh, politics, uh, trinity, politics, the state of exception, and the friend-enemy uh, distinction were crucial for all the building blocks of his constitutional writing. What we must now turn to then is how China's status scholars have adopted and adapted this trinity to fit China and to serve the rule, the rule of Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party, for which they argue is the best for China. For this, I have chosen three representative Chinese scholars, all well recognized internationally. The first is Zhang Shudong, who is a professor at New York University and a graduate of Beijing University. The second, Zhang Shigong, also a law professor at Beijing University, whose specialty is constitutionalism and, and China's constitution. And finally, Qi Zheng, who is at East China Normal University and one of the key writers in terms of, 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 of Schmidt and his implication and, and Schmidt's implications for China. So I'm going to look at these three in light of first Zhang Shudong, who's looking at the politics of conflict, Zhang Shigong in terms of the state of exception, and Qi Zheng as the friend enemy homogeneity. Now, all of these three writers deal with all aspects of Schmidt's trinity, as do a whole lot of other scholars, but these are helpful in that these three uh, 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 examples give you a sense of how Schmidt's ideas are coming into and being used within China. And so I call this Schmidt with Chinese characteristics. Um, let's begin first with Zhang Shudong, politics as, con uh, as conflict. Zhang Shudong turns to um, Schmidt's politics of conflict to unshackle Chinese ideology from the politics and the ill-fitting colonial garments of Western democratic liberalism. 
Zhang argues that China shouldn't mimic the West's political space delimited by Western universal values such as science, democracy, and liberty. Simply because the Western gaze casts China's um, cultural identity as an inferior mode of Western discourse. Instead, Zhang argues, Chinese subjectivity and exceptionalism are self-sufficient. Drawing on Schmidt, he argues that were China to adopt the market and political liberalism of the West, it would abandon China's genuine ideal of social equality. First, CCP ideological roots, Zhang argues, are anti-liberal. Second, only the Chinese Communist Party represents and can articulate the interests of the whole proletariat on the basis of its knowledge of society in its totality. Further, the Chinese Communist Party's position above the state administration allows it to intervene politically based on a politics based on Schmidt's friend enemy distinction and allows it to identify and thwart the people's enemies. Thus, Zhang uses Schmidt to defend China's exceptionalism based on its contextual and homogeneous uniqueness made possible by the authority, intervention, and representation of the Chinese Communist Party. For Zhang, were China to abandon this unique political exception, China would be caught between an increasingly individualized consumerist liberalism or its opposite, a domineering authoritarianism that would result in China's decline as a unique and powerful nation with its own appropriate political and economic order. That brings us to Jiang Shigong. Jiang Shigong, again, is a leading intellectual writer law professor in Beijing. In fact, he has been uh, called the intellectual warrior for Shiism or Xi Jinpingism. In terms of Schmidt's state of exception, Zhang notes that the question hinges on what is the place of law and the constitution in relationship to the sovereign power. It is precisely here where Zhang has applies Schmidt to explain the unique nature of Chinese constitutionalism, designed to allow the supreme leader to declare a state of exception, according to, Chinese, according to the Chinese constitutional model. Whereas Western liberal democracies, constitutional government has a thing known as judicial review. What judicial review refers to is where courts and constitution serve as a check on executive power and government leaders and bureaucratic departments to ensure that officials obey the law and fulfill their duties outlined by the law. The rule of law and the role of constitutions provide norms for modern orderly existence and basic justice and almost uh, and so either there is an unwritten constitution or there's a written constitution, but the law forms the basis of modern Western democracies. Nonetheless, in national crises, laws and courts mitigate, according to um, Jiang, effective direct action needed to protect the nation and destroy its enemies, who too easily hide behind rights, laws, and clever solicitors. Thus, Zhang uh, uh, argues that this, uh, that this represents a constitutional paradox. He says that you need law in the normal order of things of day to day, but there are times when the executive power has to overrule the law and sweep it aside to be able to deal with any kind of special state of exception that arises. Thus, Zhang argues. We will never regard the constitution as only a legal document. Why? Because the constitution cannot guarantee itself. 
the Constitution must be ensured by a political power beyond and above the law. As Carl Schmitt said, the major issue of politics is to distinguish between ourselves and the enemy. The problem is not one of freedom, but one of conquering the enemy. This is the essence of politics, the essence that liberals dare not face. Only in the critical moments of existing state power or of life and death struggle can we really understand why Schmidt, det Schmidt detests the endless dialogue of political romanticists. Thus for Jung, this combination of law and the power of the CCP to overcome the law allows for sound politics in times of stability or in times of chaos and crisis. For, for Jiang, CCP and the sovereign must be the final arbiter of when a state of exception exists and thus may, uh, must be able to set aside the law when needed. Further, as Jiang notes, it is this state of exception, again, Schmidt's language, where the friend enemy distinction are more important than legal niceties. But for the friend enemy distinction, we need to turn to Qi Zheng of East China Normal University and her application to Schmidt at this point. Qi argues, she argues that China's revolution and the establishment of the People's Republic of China was the inauguration of true democracy in China. The revolution provided popular legitimacy as a bottom up, bottoms up movement that forged collectivity and common consciousness by revolutionary violence and upheaval. Qi argues that peaceful or consensual means toward democracy could not establish the political friendship necessary for China's new kind of politics. Only revolutionary struggle could. No matter how brutal the revolution, it instilled a process of determining friend from enemy and made, uh, made it China's, uh, China's People's Republic founding successful. Only after this founding violence is there a need for ordinary democratic politics. Turning to Schmidt, she argues that democracy is always based on the principle of making friends and enemies uh, or, or making friend enemy distinctions and forming a greater homogeneity. China's democracy is, only, is the only legitimating force to bring homogeneity in China because it eradicates the political threat of heterogeneity. But it doesn't end there for Qi. For even after the revolution, the state at times must intervene to, a la Schmidt's state of exception, protect homogeneity. Thus a democratic China will not be liberal democratic. China instead will be a democracy of friends and equals who are the people as defined by the, pow the sovereign power. Qi argues then that China is a strong state democracy, but it does not respect the rights of those who are indifferent or hostile to the state. They have no rights. China requires individuals to make the interest of the state its priority. Thus, uh, Schmittian democracy, according to Qi, is the key to this. In this way, Qi weaponizes democracy in a way that utilizes all political and social instruments toward the unifying of the state, whether it be new, a new revolutionary movement by the CCP or not. Schmittian democracy is a political force that Qi believes effectively legitimates whatever rule exists in China. Thus, we see in these three scholars, the Schmittian trinity of concepts of seeing uh, and seeing this in this way is helpful. But the question remains, is Schmitt's trinity with Chinese characteristics at the heart of China's politics under Xi Jinping? 
or is it merely scholarly, uh, scholarly apologetic and obsequious window dressing by status scholars to curry favor and uh, of powerful um, of C and powerful uh, Chinese Communist Party uh, leaders? To answer this question, let us turn to three recent incidents and crises where Xi Jinping and the CCP have taken dramatic action to address a crisis. And whether Schmidt's Trinity emerges in actual policy and engagement or whether it doesn't apply at all. Let's begin with Xinjiang. Uh, oh, we will begin with Xinjiang and the moves against perceived threats of Uyghur violence, independence, and religious identity. Next, we will turn to Hong Kong and the putting into the place of the new security law to curb uh, uh, Hong Kong's democratic movements. Finally, we will look at sinicization of Christianity and religion. Naturally, uh, each of these will be brief in that uh, such diverse uh, the, that these each deserve full uh, analysis in themselves, but there's not enough time in this lecture. Nonetheless, what I wish to establish is the pattern, is Schmidt's trinity, and to see if it holds. The fundamental conflict that there uh, that then raises the questions of special of special measures, and the state of exception for direct action, do these occur in these three cases? Turning to Xinjiang. The problem facing Xi and the CCP and Xi Jinjiang is threefold. First, separatism, or what is referred to as splitism in China. That is to say, ethnic or religious minorities that seek independence from China, such as in Tibet and in Xinjiang. But, and this has been a, an issue in both regions since the founding of the PRC. But of late, there have been terrorist acts. In fact, according to leaked documents, there were three incidents that instilled Xi's most recent or the recent policy in terms of Xinjiang and the incarceration of over 1 million Uyghurs and Kazakhs. Um, Islam is a political religion that puts Islamic identity, culture, society before national identity. Uyghurs and other Muslims have struggled with being identified as Chinese. And this has grown more intense over the past 30 years, especially with the arrival of Han migrants. As James Millward of Georgetown University has pointed out, it is the intensity of the CCP response that is unprecedented. And it took the world and even Chinese scholars by surprise. First, the massive uh, collective punishment, detention, and, and re-education approach to deal with the threat of terrorism based on three acts is unprecedented, even for China. The utter sweeping away of the nominal formal constitutional guarantees of freedom of religion and religious practice for Muslim in China, again, has not been done in this way before. That according to leaked documents, the crackdown, re-education camps and ideological campaign come from Xi Jinping himself as CCP and CCP officials very close to him. This comes right from the top. Further, the documents treat this as a state of exception by order of Xi to decimate the enemy and to bring homogeneity by eliminating Uyghur heterogeneity. The irony right now is with the camps in Xinjiang, we see something we never saw even in the Cultural Revolution because they've singled out a people on the basis of their ethnicity. In so doing, this appears as an ethnic rather than a class cleansing. There are no appeals for Uyghurs to throw off their chains and rebel against their bosses, that would require them to, to um, attack their Han bosses and, 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 and thus would be an attack on homogeneity. As such, this has nothing to do with Marxists 
Leninist, or even Maoist thought, but rather along the lines of Schmidt and, and the National Socialist uh, and the National Socialists in Germany at the time of the Third Reich. The stated goal, and this is stated in internal documents and in public statements by Xinjiang public officials, and even in the foreign ministry, is to attempt to inoculate people from extremist thinking, to eliminate a thought virus in Huager minds by locking them up for months and years or subjecting them to indoctrination followed by a kind of coercive labor regime. Indeed, the move against the Huegers and the Kazakhs in Xinjiang parallels that of the United States in the racist internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, or Jews and gypsies or others in Europe, and of course, the Nazis as well. Naturally, this is all disturbing, but this pogrom takes on the very pattern of Schmidt's views and his support for the elimination of, the Jew, of Jews by the Nazis around the central idea of homogenization. Thus, in turn, at every point in the, in the Xinjiang crisis, Schmidt's trinity appears essential. Politics of crisis and conflict, a state of exception where formal law no longer applies, and homogenization, an ethnic and cultural and, uh, solution uh, uh, that is largely ethnic, an ethnic cultural lobotomy. The evidence that these are essential and not accidental, nor scholarly airbrushing, would appear to put this in, within Schmidt's script as official policy and action of Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party. What of Hong Kong? Hong Kong uh, uh, has also been seen by C as a profound crisis, but different that, that in that the above, it involves a, a, a largely Han, Han, Hong Kong population um, that is at odds with the mainland. The crisis has been brewing slowly since the handover, but policy began to shift noticeably from 2013 to the present when uh, President Xi came to power. From 2013 forward, increasing pressure has been put in place to secure the loyalty of Hong Kong and distinguish between friends and enemies of CCP rule. Indeed, with the rise of Xi, Smith rhetoric and policy begin to be fashioned and put in place by those mentioned earlier. In 2013, Zhang Shigong, who we mentioned earlier, who is the constitutional scholar at Beijing uh, University, noted that it was important to note that Zhang, uh, well, it's important to note that Zhang was made advisor to Hong Kong um, and has been working in Hong Kong since 2013 forward to bring about, uh, and he was working with the Hong Kong Chinese to try to put in place a security law. It is interesting that he is quoted as saying that he was encouraging the Hong Kong authorities and the Hong Kong uh, government officials to put in the security law to avoid a life or death scenario. These are the very terms that he used previously when he was writing about the place of constitutional law, a state of exception. So either they accept the security law or law will be swept away. Recall, John, that this is the essence of politics, that the essence that liberals always dare not face. Only in critical moments of seizing state power or of life and death struggle can we really understand why Schmidt detests the endless dialogue of political romanticists. That's John. This life or death struggle is a Schmidt term. And those in legal circles would have known, even at that time in 2013, that J what Zhang was saying was a threat, that they risked being in a state of exception in which the CCP would have to intervene, sweep away the law, and treat the opposition as heterogeneous and to be eliminated. 
the rounding up and arrest of opposition politicians and charging them with subversion merely for being opposition is fundamentally against the basic law of one country, two systems. But for all practical purposes, it has been swept aside over the last few weeks. And with the passing of the new security legislation <clears throat> um, to identify CCP friends and to, and to destroy CCP enemies, which is the Hong Kong opposition party. Once again, the moves against Hong Kong have come up, come from C himself and not from the normal cor uh, course of adherence to law. Thus here again, the Schmidt uh, triangle appears. Politics arising from conflict, a state of exception announced and enforced and homo homogenization, the bringing together of enemies and the elimination of those who disagree. Finally, we turn to Christianity in China and she's moved towards the sinicization of religion and more particularly Christianity in China. In terms of the state of exception, um, if there is a crisis, it, is, it has not been stated as such, though there have been rumblings over the last decades of the inroads Christianity has made in the highest echelons of China, Chinese society, whether that is in academics, business, or even the Chinese Communist Party. Indeed, the attempt to purge the CCP of Christians under the Xi regime is important to note. What is more telling is the attention that Xi himself has paid to religion and the sinicization of Christianity in political speeches and official acts to enforce sinicization. As I have noted in other works, ideologically, bureaucratically, and legally, the state has moved decisively to try, uh, to try to rein in the autonomy and influence of Christianity, but even more significantly to transform Christianity at its biblical and doctrinal core. As Xi Lian of Duke University has noted, Xi Jinping um, and the Communist Party want to create a new version of Christianity shorn of its transcendent visions and values. It has even put into motion the production of official state translations of the Bible, removing passages irreconcilable with core socialist values, while preserving a measure of the original poetry. Even this would demand translation expertise and theological training that the party selected handpicked experts don't have. The Celian notes, that such an idea reveals Beijing's staggering arrogance of power, that even Chinese emperors never attempted such a feat. Nonetheless, does this truly represent a state of exception? As we have seen uh, uh, in, uh, in constitutional scholars in China have pointed out that during the reign of Xi, all right, or, or these are uh, non-Chinese constitutional scholars, have pointed out that during Xi's reign, that a state of exception is, is not seen as brief or momentary, but a steady state. According to Jacques Delisle, it is now apparent that Xi's China operates in a permanent, but almost never declared state of emergency. Laws conferring special power seem superfluous at best. China does not have aspirationally or episodically liberal democratic rule of law constitutional order that would describe or even partly explain its frequent or lasting or justify legally or could be justified legally in terms of reference to law. Given China's exceptionalism defended by status, altering the law remains relatively easy because laws do not constrain the state they represent little evident risk to the regime and its prerogatives because legal protection of rights is already weak. Mandates for exceptional power threaten only limited damage to such law and modest additional danger for possible victims of state action. 
further, as commentators have noted, the move to destroy churches, tear down crosses, circumvent the then, uh, circumvented the then religious laws, or, and then to turn around and change the religious law after the fact, all suggest a constant state of exemption. But to what end? It would appear to put pressure on Christians and the church to conform. In many ways, this does, uh, this does echo the pressures that were upon the churches in the 1950s as part of the work of the United Front to identify and isolate enemies and scare others into dutiful submission to government control of religion. Now, however, rather than the requirement to embrace revolutionary dogma and collectivism, it would appear to follow Schmittian lines of pressure to eliminate heterogeneity. Thus, we see again, in terms of addressing uh, China's Christianity, a politics arising from an inherent conflict. But this one is ideological and a religious conflict. Secondly, a, con a, a state of exception where basic law is regularly suspended and security laws imposed. And finally, and most deadly, homogenization, that if one does not conform, one is defined as an enemy and to be eliminated. Thus we end, oops, there's Hong Kong and citizenization in China. Thus we end where we began. Is C a new Mao? What I would say is what C is not, is not Mao. He off, what he offers is not Maoism, but a new hybrid that owes more to Schmidt than to Mao Zedong or Marx or Lenin. His reign exists in an almost apocalyptic state of exemption that can and often does break into normal life, sometimes for good, as we have seen in the decisive actions taken to address the pandemic in China. This was declared a state of exception, and you could see the kind of forces that the state could marshal without any, having any of the problems of litigation and parliaments and everything else. It just was put into place. Sometimes, however, as in Xinjiang and Hong Kong, the results are more ambivalent. The shift by Xi has greatly enhanced the place and role in CCP in public life, as we've seen. Further, given Xi and CCP and Schmidt's antinomy to civil society, universal values, and the press, uh, all which is contained in document nine, which I don't have enough time to go into, we can see that liberals in China are now on the back foot and being removed from any place, both not just in terms of politics or ethnicity, but even in the academic world. So being a friend or enemy has now moved into the halls of the academy. And that has got to be scary for a lot of academics in China. Further, given the emphasis upon ethnic, cultural, political, and religious homogeneity, and one could even argue intellectual homogeneity and the elimination of heterogeneity, the future does not look bright for those in Xinjiang, Hong Kong, or in the universities. Where all this, uh, uh, where all this will lead is hard to say, but it represents a significant shift away from Leninism, Marxism, and Mao Zedong thought. Given that there is no constitutional check on party power, it's hard to imagine how even the current state could resist what happened in the Cultural Revolution when all law was cast away and now is referred to as the bad 10 years. For the church, its teaching, its ministry, and its mission, it must now not just adjust to Marxism, Leninism, and Maoist thought, but rather it find its public place and identity within or in opposition to a Schmittian trinity now in place in China. And I will end on a slightly more humorous note. I got time, yeah, just in time for a good joke. <laughs>
when we were in Guangzhou, I, we were downtown and all of a sudden we began to see on the buses, this poster of Mao right up on the front by the driver, you know, and it would be, and you'd see Mao's face going down and there were big posters. So it looked like Mao was almost driving the bus. So one time I got sat on the bus and I asked the bus driver, I said, is there a movement afar, uh, afoot? Is there a new Maoism rising in China? And he goes, ah, nah, nah. He says, Mao's dead and he went to hell. But he said, even in hell, all the devils fear him because he's the meanest, toughest guy around. And so we put him on the front of the buses because it keeps the demons away from our bus and we can drive and not get into any accidents. <laughs> so I don't know, if, I don't think C posters will work quite as good as Mao's, but anyway, so that's my lecture and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. Uh, Tom, uh, I, I can see parallels between your description of China and uh, what, what's really happening in, in India and uh, the BJP and the RSS. Um, I don't know if you've uh, seen this uh, Sweden-based um, We Dem Institute uh, report, which kind of downgrades uh, the, the democracy in India. Uh, so India is no more the, the largest democracy in the world. Uh, uh, but it's actually what is described as uh, electoral autocracy. Uh, and I see that, you know, in India, we have an intact institution of parliament. Uh, we are also investing a lot of money in building a new building, parliament building. Uh, but the very idea of parliamentary democracy is being challenged in India. Yeah. And, and, and there is no patience for this lumbering legislative process in India anymore. Uh, politicians across the board, including the Congress and, and several other parties, uh, want executive power. Uh, they want uh, this power to decide and decide very, very quickly. Uh, but the problem is that all this power to decide is being concentrated in just one person. Right. Or the PMO, the prime minister's office. That's the problem. You see how this, these ideas of sovereignty on the one hand and, and dictatorship on the other hand are coming together. They are being fused in India. Yeah. But my question is to do with Carl Schmidt, really. Mm -hmm. uh, I understand that he, he was a Christian he, he was, was a Catholic, Catholic yeah, he was Christian. Yeah. I'm just wondering how he was able to reconcile some of these ideas on dictatorship, Nazism, his support, his support for Nazism with his Christian uh, commitment. How was that possible? Well, it's interesting. The, the book you need to get is, is Political Theology, which was his first book, 1923. Uh -huh. And it's a bit uh, philosophical, but it's interesting. He follows Hobbes. And his thought follows Hobbes in this. Hobbes argued that Christianity itself was based off of the idea of one, the law, and the law formed a sense of normalcy. But that normalcy led to our own kind of struggle and, and, and almost a crisis. And so Hobbes argued for what he called miracle. And the miracle was in, Jesus, who was not confounded by the law or restrained, but could go over the top and therefore rescue humankind by miracle. What Schmidt does is then takes that and puts it into a theological, I mean, to a political framework. And so what he argues is, is that Germany is in such crisis, it requires a miracle. Mm. And that miracle needs a strong leader because he's seeing everything collapse. The other thing, what he puts his finger on and why he's a brilliant scholar. When you read his stuff, he, 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 you're almost convinced. <laughs> but, but part of it, he's saying, look, parliamentary democracy doesn't work. It does get everything down into these bitter fights. How can, and, and we need, productive policies of where the people are coming together. And he saw this as Christian, all right?
But even he, he only lasts till 1936 and then he's kicked out of the Nazi party. Yeah. And he, he, he was never allowed to have an academic post again. Although he wrote several more books and that because he was, he was tainted by Nazism. But in that he, he believes that his ideas were not fully embraced. All right. I'm not sure I agree with that. I think there's a place for constraint upon sinful human nature and the law. I really do believe you must have a rule of law that holds those who govern in check and make them accountable to the law. If you don't have that, um, it gets repeated again and again. And what we're seeing in Xinjiang, much to the chagrin of, 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 of uh, CCP and, and government officials in Xinjiang, they, they're writing back to the government saying, this isn't working. But, but because there's no law, people don't know what to do. So anyway, it, it's not working. Well, let's see what happens in Hong Kong too. So, yeah. I'm pretty sure there are lots of questions. Uh, I, I already see one hand up, uh, but there is uh, Anton Knut who wanted yeah, to ask hey. a question, but he wasn't able to raise his electronic hand up. So, <laughs> so please go ahead, Anton. Okay, you're Thanks first. Thanks so much, Tom, for this meaningful lecture. And I think this uh, connection between mm. theology and uh, public law and politics is really interesting mm. because I once met in Hong Kong um, Xiao Thing Liu, that theologian who actually wrote his dissertation in Basel with um, uh, Mr. Hot. And he seems yes. to be one of those intellectuals in, in China. You know, he worked at the Sino Christian Institute, Dao Fong Shang in Hong Kong who has been uh, instrumental in, in transmitting Carl Schmitt to the Chinese intellectual scene. And right. I, yeah. think, I think what is interesting if we compare um, Weimar Republic German to China is that search for an identity which is not Western. Because Germany it took long to realize it is better in, in the Western hemisphere. <laughs> But it, it, it considered itself something like a middle middle power. Didn't want to be, didn't want to be Western. So on that ground, Schmidt grew like Emanuel Hirsch or, or other uh, thinkers uh, like uh, Heidegger or so. Mm -hmm. and, and 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 now my question is, what what would you say? How has he been um, receptive in, in in China? Is that one of the biggest kind of lines through theology, like Xiao Feng Lui? And, and the search for identity, for a Chinese identity, which is not Western. Well, I would say in China today, at least the people that I read are actually struggling with this. This is much more of a political move than the Schmidt. Of course, I haven't seen a lot of the writings coming out of Nanjing. So I wouldn't be surprised if some people have begun to pick up on Schmidt and, and, and begin to work with it. Um, the discomfort comes <laughs> more in terms of direct response to government policy. So I know from my connections, for example, those who have been asked to retranslate the scripture can't seem to get across because you gotta be really careful about what you say back to power. <laughs> but they're saying, this is a double-edged sword and we get both ends, <laughs> both sides. You see, if you force us to change the text of scripture, to conform to the leadership of the party and not and, and, and not go, and not ultimate sovereignty of God, we'll lose everybody in the state church. And people will go, well, that, yeah, that's what the state church is. They're, they're heretics. All right? So you can you can boss us around, but everybody's gonna go underground, okay, or or hide out. So they're in a very uh, a great predicament. Anton, where the interesting question lies, and I didn't get to it here, but I've been thinking about it and writing about it in some further papers, is that Protestants in China want to be loyal citizens. And they want to be regarded as Chinese. And they want to be part of that homogenous friends. In fact, research that's been done on that shows that in terms of their support of the government and their, and their, and their, their love of China, it's equal to those that are not believers. But if they are forced to choose between Jesus as Lord and the state is Lord, that creates all kinds of problems. And it created problems in Germany, as you know. 
in the German churches, you had Jewish Christians. And the Nazis said they must be separated out. They, you, you, you cannot baptize them. They, they, they have to go away. And most Protestants agreed with the government. It's very few who, it, it, a small did, the confessing church, actually one of the best resistors were the Jehovah's Witnesses. Mm. Many of them were sent to the camps and killed. But it's, but Protestants tend to be, we tend to be chameleons who blend to the color of the state. So it'll be interesting. A lot of this is new and it's developing, but how that'll be, I, I've got a feeling you're gonna get a lot of people who are Schmittian Christians. But can you be consistently? Because C, at least, here's the difference in the sense that Germ Germany was basically Christian. Most people went to church, either Catholic, Protestant, or Lutheran, all right, Reformed or Lutheran. China is inherently not. Secondly, all this takes place after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So one of the discourses as of forming the top government official was the role of religion and the decay of the Soviet empire. So one of the things that's informing C and what he's trying to get is to remove the threat that they see as the church. And, and, and C. Lian of Duke University uh, uh, talks about this quite a bit. Okay, uh, Tom, I, I saw Michael Beadle's hand and T.B. Thomas's hand before Stuart. Uh, so we'll, we'll follow this order. Okay. Michael first, then T.B. Thomas, then Stuart, and then Damon. Okay. Michael? Yeah, thank you uh, for your attention and thank you, Tom, for this lecture. And I think the what I was trying to pick up was this question, how did that happen in the 23 years that uh, Schmidt was, and where I see a certain um, analogy to, to China, I think is that after the breakdown of the um, Kaiserreich, the emperor, right? There was everything in turmoil. And I think if you come from a very conservative approach, then you are thinking about order, a God-given order that is inscribed into his creation. And that was also the position of the very conservative Lutherans. Mm. And I think Schmidt in, uh, was trying to think about that, but basically his question was in a way, where is the authority? And the authority is with the authoritarian power. And I think that's a bit the same situation in China, where they ask, where is the power actually? It's not about law, it's not about distributed power and everyone having access to this, but it is in the way of where is it concentrated and who has the right to exercise it? And I think that goes, unfortunately, very well with a quite conservative and Christian attitude. Yes. Look, and I think yes. that's the point where Christianity is in danger to become inherently um, authoritarian, fundamentalist almost. And uh, that is what I wanted to contribute to the discussion and why, and I think that's one of the reasons why Schmidt might be so interested, interesting to be read by Chinese people looking for this kind of understanding of exercising power um, in a different way than maybe if you come from a law founded understanding of it and not a, by a power understanding. Thank you. So it's not a question, but maybe looking well, at- I think it's spot on, Michael. And I just say that I could have talked about Donald Trump. <laughs> right. but, but, but the difference is this, and, I, and, and, I, and you know, I talk about people in different ways. The most important thing was happened on January 6th where, where the vote was recognized. Okay, that, that was so important. So you've got to have systems but, but they're getting fragile. And Christians get frustrated with the law. And this was happening in Germany. There was stuff that needed to be done and you're just having these endless debates and, 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 and talk, 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 talk. And, and people needed action and so they wanted power. And that's what Schmidt was trying to balance. And that's what Jung is trying to balance. But if you look at it, once you get a permanent state, it, it easily moves into a permanent state of exception, or at least a hovering one, almost an apocalyptic view that comes down. And that's what we see in Hong Kong. You can see the frustration with the mainland. Why are these people rebelling about against being China? This is China's land. This, you are Chinese. 
so 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 you get the basic law swept away and the security law put in place and the opposition now in prison. Um, you know, we get frustrated, but what we do when we get frustrated can be very bad. <laughs> TV, TV Thomas? Uh, uh, Tom, uh, Tom uh, yeah. I'm, I'm, you have given me an appetite to go and read uh, Schmidt, which I only, which I only knew uh, two paragraphs of. But the question I have is, was the thinking of Schmidt already in Chinese uh, power uh, arenas, or was it adopted by Z and then they uh, fleshed it up? What was the influence on Z? Okay, well, um, in terms of the of how she enters, I mean Schmidt enters. He's actually uh, kicked around back in the fifties and forties and that. Okay. okay. He doesn't really though. He doesn't really get any traction until Liao Xiaofeng, uh, Liao Xiaofeng brings it in. And, um, and he's interested, on, again, he got his PhD from Basel and he's, he's interested in a detranscentralized Christianity or what's called cultural Christianity because he sees right. Christianity a system to be put in place, but he's not sure about Jesus, right? So, mm. <laughs> anyway. So, 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 but it gets, I, I thought about talking about Leo Xiaofeng, but then I thought, no, I want to get these through because they are the new statists that are shaping things going forward. Where it get, begins to get traction is in 2000 forward under Hu Jintao, Wen Xiaobo, uh, then it really grabs on. And what my argument is, is that under C, it's actually, I think, reflected in China's self, uh, the CCP self-understanding policies and practice. It's no longer, in my view, Maoist or Marxist. It's now significantly Schmitty. At least that's my So, so did uh, uh, Z come into power because he bought into that thinking? No, I think Z came into power because um, of all the uh, mechanizations within the Chinese Communist Party. But I think he, he has seen in C and brought with him a group of scholars that are informing him and informing his policy and then providing justification and defense of that, but also weaponized. You see, that's the key thing is what we see in Xinjiang, what we see in Hong Kong are not just sort of embellishments on the side of trying to explain what's going on. They actually have elements of C in their actual policy and, and, and putting it on. So my argument is that in Xinjiang and in Hong Kong at least, and it's a little bit more tentative with Christianity, that this is, this is in the highest echelons of policy and practice and, and Schmidt is informing that. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, Stuart was next, but he, I saw him walking away. Uh, so uh, maybe, Damon, you can ask your question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Find him. Yeah, thank you for your lecture, Tom, um, for all your interest in uh, Chinese people and Chinese nations. I just want to share that as a Chinese, I'm aware of the deep consciousness, a Chinese consciousness that the border around China, which is a very long one, is always a worry was always a worry to the emperors yeah. because you have the bar what, what we call Chinese to call barbarian on the left, on the west, on the and the north. Even the south, south, southern people are, are kind of called barbarian. Yeah. So those people in the middle are very wary of of the um, all these barbarian surrounding them. So, and in the history of of China, there are lots of fighting against the, the, the barbarian enemies. That's why you have the Great War, you know? Yeah. There's a deep consciousness. I mean, the um, Chinese have been conquered by the barbarian several times, and that it, it hit them very deep in their psyche. Mm. And so there is no, it, 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 because Chinese, China is such a large country, it's very hard to get homogeneity. You will always get people different from you, from the Hans. 
near the borders. And that has always uh, has been a problem for centuries. So there is a deep problem with the, the, the boundary in the Chinese consciousness. There's very, very little homogeneity. And, and, and all, if we look at the more recent uh, history of China in the last 200 years, we have experienced very painful history, extremely mm -hmm. painful history. As a Chinese, I can say that. And now, well, the, the Chinese Communist Party say, well, we have it very good now. We are so strong. Mm -hmm. So we can't afford to lose these positions. They are very scared of losing this position, which, which, is, which is tremendously different from, say, the last 200 years. We have it so good now. We, we are so scared of losing this. So they, they would do everything, try to, to secure what, you know, the present situation. And so for them, they're scared of losing it. Yeah. Uh, I think that and they, they would tr do anything to, to secure what they have now. And so if we look at this, this, this kind of a long-term history of China, almost fearful of the enemies on the West and the North, and the recent Chinese history, I, I can see why the leaders are struggling uh, to, you know, to, to they, 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 they would have this hard handed, heavy handed uh, rule. I, I, you know, I, I, I try to put myself in their shoes. I mean, as the leader, you don't want to squander this. It's mm -hmm. huge responsibility. But I'm not saying that they're doing, doing the right thing. I'm just trying to say that don't, they don't actually see a way out. Hmm. This is the best that they can do. I don't know. I mean, only uh, only Christianity can can change things. I, I I suppose, but because they are not Christian, that's the only way they they think they can secure this prosperity that we have earned it now. Okay. End of comment. <laughs> a good comment, Damon, and I resonate with that completely. It's not an easy thing, and China has been successful, as I noted. There are things about this kind of direct action by the party and the uh, and she that's very popular. But the problem is what do you do with the Huygers? And what do you do with the Hong Kong Chinese? And what do you do with the Christians? That's the, that's the delicate issue. Mm. Yeah. They don't they don't know how to do it apart from brute force. That's the problem. That's they don't true. find a, 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 another way. That's, a, that's the only way that they know. That's the only way that the emperor in the past has have, 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 have resorted to it. Just, you know, the emperor used to just rule and, and just put down anyone who disagree with him. I mean, this is, this is the way that Chinese have, have known how to, how to govern. We don't know another way. That's the problem. What, what I would say, though, and, and I, you know, there's only so much I go into my paper. What Zhang Qihong would argue is that China has two things parallel that in normal times that are not states of exception, that it has rules of law and rule by law. And that in fact, China's rated relatively high internationally in terms of having law. And this is very important for markets and business. So within all these arguments is a recognition of the law. What they say is the benefit of Schmidt is it allows those times when law can be circumvented and it will not serve its purpose of judicial review, and also the formation of civil society, which was strongly put down by C in his document nine, which again, I didn't have time to go into, but that's a very important development. What I, you know, I have a very different Christian vision of things. Mine is much more along the lines of Thomas Masaryk of Czechoslovakia, that it's actually the secret is in terms of the, the development and of civil society and in terms of excellence and, and following up a Christian vision of the state. A real interesting person to read is, is, was the founder of the Czech Republic back in um, the early 20th century that was sadly put down by the Nazis. Okay, uh, thank you, Tom. Uh, our time is moving quickly. I want to get as many questions as possible. So Stuart is next, then David Drew, and then Tim. Yeah. Stuart, unmute, unmute, unmute yourself, Stuart. Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, 
Sorry about that. Quite fascinating, Tom, and I, this was all new to me. Hmm. There's something paradoxical in the story as I have heard it, which may not be the same as how you told it, that uh, some, somewhere in the core of this is the desire for China to be different and to be distinct and not have to play by other people's rules. And yet here is a body of academics and probably people of some influence mm. who are appealing in a sense to a, a conservative Western writer, actually one rather strongly out of fashion for quite good reasons, which is his role in uh, the Nazi era. era. So why is Schmidt of interest to them? Do they need uh, a rather um, a Western writer, a rather doubtful reputation to bolster their, or is this actually argument for us, which is see here, you should have followed Schmidt. <laughs> Good question um, and, and, and a good insight in that. And I think Anton actually sort of answered it in the sense that Germany was looking for an exceptionalism um, uh, in, in the time of the 20s and 30s. So his argument there was not universal. Um, and so I think that's what they they latch on to. When you actually read the documents of um, Yang Chudong and Zhang Chi Hong, uh, uh, Zhang they, what they're, what they're railing against is the pressure within constitutional law uh, circles of certain universal truths of, mod of the modern world. And they want to offer a Chinese exception and a Chinese uniqueness and a particular way forward and a rejection. Uh, and the other thing that's all complicated in this, uh, um, Stuart, is that the liberals believe in this universalism. One of the fascinating subnotes on this, Stuart, you find it's fascinating, is that our conference, we had a China conference 2013 and we were gonna have a conference in 2015. And so I asked the Chinese representatives what would be the best title they would recommend? What are they interested in? And this was a combination of new left, um, I don't know if any statists were involved at that point. It was kind of new, but the Christians and the new Confucians and what they gave back as a title, could you talk on universal values and China distinctives, which would have been really appropriate and everyone was signing on. I mean, it was, it was going to be knock out of the park, but then we got rumblings and this is 2015 in fall, 2014, C puts out his, document 19, and in Chinese, it's called the Qi Bujong, or the seven no talkabouts. And one of those no talkabouts is you can't talk about universal values, all right? So what happens, in, and again, this is, this is Schmidt language coming in, but we had to call off the conference because of it. I got, I got a letter from the liberals in, in Beijing who said, I think, Tom, you need to postpone. <laughs> All right. but isn't you were very light on the continuing influence of Marxist Leninism? Yes. Isn't that part of thoroughgoing Marxist Leninism. Marxism and Leninism is 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 universal. And even Maoism was universal. They built they, is what the yeah. party makes of it. What's that story? Go ahead again. What's universal is the party's view. The party can change what it thinks is appropriate. They can do that, but they still believe it. it's kind of like the church when they change. There's still the enduring eternal truth that always exists that we're just now catching up with. But there was a sense of, in terms of class warfare and the class revolution, of a, of a, of a universal Hegelian framework that was inexorable. And this, this was deeply a part of that. What I would argue is, is that has changed in China now. That idea of <coughs> universal Marxist narrative that's true for all people at all times and all places no longer is, is upheld. Rather they say each nation has its own path to trod and uh, there is no standard to hold it up to. 
Okay, and um, the time remaining, I suppose we can, we can have just three more questions. So the next person is David, David Rowe. Hey, David. Hey, hey Tom, good to, good to see you. Um, good to hear you. I guess the, can you hear me? Yeah, 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 good. Okay, great, great. So the question I have is, um, how widespread is this? Uh, uh, I mean, we, you know, we've had two uh, conferences before on, you know, inviting and Neil Maoist to, you know, to even to Oxford. Uh, but, you know, this uh, Carl Schmidt has, is it a recent thing among just a few scholars? Or do you sense this is a broader thing? Because uh, my sense, though, is although I, I can see a lot of the correlations, uh, the average Communist Party member or even the average person would still go back to the neo Maoist uh, if they're conservative. And in general, most of the people are are kind of like what uh, Damon said. Uh, they just want to revive China to its former glory and more of a defense against anti-Western encroachment and the reason why they're going against Xinjiang uh, so harshly is because they sense that's their only way of influence. And in order to go westward to the Muslim world, they got to deal with this issue and they might as well just, um, you know, um, deal with the, the terrorism there and all the criticisms that they okay. will. So, so I guess that, that would be my question. How, how widespread would that be? Well, that's, that's a good question, David. Um, in academic circles, it's very powerful and very widespread among the among the Laobaisi, no, <laughs> and also most party members are not being trained in, in, in Schmidt. All right, they're just being trained as most party members and being obedient and loyal and doing their job. Um, but in terms of, if you, you should do a little searching, Dave, and I can send you over the documents, but it's quite pervasive. Uh, one guy on the call here, Rob, and I were talking about this the other day, and I, I, I introduced Schmidt to him. and before we, he, he left and then came back and interviewed me, he said, man, I didn't realize how big this was. It's much bigger than you think. And it's at the highest levels. I mean, that was my argument, David. This appears in the rhetoric and the policy of Xi himself. So now whether he's picked up Schmidt and read him or he's listening to his academic advisors and his scholars within the upper echelons of the party. Either way, it's really important because it's not just window dressing, it's essential. That's what I'm seeing in terms of the evidence and the patterns. So it's important for us and it's important for the Chinese church to realize what's coming. What's coming is, is, is narratives especially from the United Front and others that are not Marxist Maoist. They're going to be increasingly Schmittian, even if it's just in terms of taking what they've heard from above and passing it on. But uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, what do you call it? The whoop and warp of that, the, the structure of this is deeply Schmittian and it is extremely powerful, especially at Beijing University, at, at uh, Tsinghua and others. And there's a massive bottle, battle going on. And you know, I'm one of those people that really believe ideas have consequences. I think you're right though, David, it's not on the ground. And, uh, but, it's, but it is among the academics and those that are informing the top level leadership. Tim, um, thank you. It's, it's this, the issue of homogeneity. Yeah. Um, the, the weakness of homogen, homogeneity, if I can say it properly, um, is that um, it kind of cuts you off from being fertilized with ideas from elsewhere. And I was wondering how did how does she see China being able to still still have the ability to um, to be fertilized uh, um, in, in, if, if there's no if there's no disparity amongst the people, they're all the same. It's for, it's not a monochromatic society. Well, I, 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 yeah, I'm reading through Schmidt, and I'm going to have to read more. My sense is he would probably say that there's a distinction in a lot of conversations between those that are friends. Uh, people can be friends and disagree with you. All right. Mm -hmm. He was much more interested in terms of constitutional law. You know, if your only attitude is there's two things, you know, two ways, my way and the right way, and they're both the same, then you won't, 
uh, get any kind of input. Um, what I would say is though, is I would agree with you, Tim, that there, there are reasons for academic freedom and there are reasons for having what we call loyal opposition and people who critique you because without that, you, you, you don't get stronger and you don't deal with the flaws. Uh, so yeah, I, I hear what you're saying, Tim. And I, I don't think it's everybody being exactly alike, but that there's a borderline. And that's what, in terms of Schmidt and in terms of his interpreters, it is Xi Jinping who determines when you cross that line, okay? So <laughs> give you an example. Of, uh, from Singapore, for anybody on my Singapore uh, uh, coming in from overseas to listen to this. When I was in Singapore, um, the government came out and said, look, we will allow some discussion going on, but there are boundary markers. And if you go beyond the boundary, then the government has a right to punish you. It's very <laughs> So of course, the next question is, can you please tell us where that boundary is? And they said, no, but we'll let you know when you crossed it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so in Singapore, we had a relatively a, a amount of discussion, but there was a point. In fact, the government actually did this. It was very interesting in terms of how Singapore handled issues. They would open it up for a period of discussion and say, okay, discussion's over. And you can't talk about this anymore. It's kind of like the Catholic Church. But <laughs> that's how it worked. It was fascinating because I was with the National Council and we were always dealing with these issues. And they'd give us a chance and we'd write our papers and we'd put in our white papers and give our positions on, on policy. And they'd listen for a while and then they'd go, okay, shut up. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> um, just one last question from the text box. Uh, let sure. me read it to you. It's from Timothy Mutsushi. Oh, Timothy, hi Timothy. He's, he's with us. So if, if there's any clarification, uh, you want to ask him any questions you can. Uh, but let me read it to you from here. In view of the prevailing circumstances in China, what options do you think that the church in China has to secure a public space and identity? Well, that's a good question. Um, well, that that itself would, would, would be a book. Um, <laughs> my sense is, I mean, I'm a follower of, as I said, Masaryk and then later Vaclav Havel who read his, his writings of Liu Xiaobo and others. I think that there's a sense of freedom and response of integrity where you live your lives out excellently. But I think, you know, as was said, and even David noted, is that Christians themselves get caught up in these things and don't see the problem with what's going on in Xinjiang and why they should pay attention to that and why that's wrong. And just because, you know, it allows them to kind of plow through Xinjiang and, and, and carry on mission back to Jerusalem, dear me, it, you know, the, the, the gospel is so much richer and deeper than just that. I mean, that's important. I believe in that. I, I'm excited for mission in China. Um, a mission by Chinese in the Chinese church. And, you know, David and I are watching this and, and writing about this. But um, how do you respond in these situations? It's not easy. I think one of the most interesting thing will be Hong Kong. Um, Hong Kong has one of the most brilliant group of people who are in opposition and who, and many of them are Christians and they understand what the places of the church to be in opposition creatively and uh, so you know maybe that's the next paper i'll give us how to respond but but it's a great question timothy and that's that's where the ball's at now is how do you respond to this but what i can say it's happening and it will be affecting religious policy in china for the years on out um uh, marina's sitting right here and i'm pretty sure uh, as the editor of transformation she'd like to grab it for transformation and I'm hoping that uh, you haven't really promised this paper. Well, to I have. Else. <laughs> oh no! So Marina will have to wait for this the second paper. Hong Kong Baptist here. University. I, I can write another one for transformation. But, but, but thank I'm you, gonna... thank you very much for this excellent uh, paper and for the discussion we had. Uh, we have the recording of this uh, uh, lecture, so if you want to listen to it. Uh, please get uh, in touch with Tom or me, uh, and we'll try to make sure that you have access to it. 
Yeah. Well, thank you very much for sparing your time for this lecture. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good to see you all. <laughs>